Welcome to Babel, Translating the Middle East, a podcast from the Middle East program at CSIS. Here on Babel, we take you beyond the headlines to take a closer look at what's happening in the Middle East and why it matters. This week on Babel, I speak with Hiba Husseini, a Palestinian lawyer and a legal advisor to Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations for 30 years. Together, we discuss the state of pro-peace communities after October 7th and the ways the war in Gaza will affect future peacemaking efforts. Then I continue the conversation with Will Todman and Leah Hickert to discuss why youth are increasingly supportive of armed struggle, the preconditions for a new Palestinian political leadership, and the ways in which Gaza's reconstruction could create opportunities for peacemaking. To translate some of what's happening in the Middle East, this is Babel. Hiba Husseini is a Ramallah-based lawyer who lives in Jerusalem. She served as a legal advisor to Palestinian peace negotiators for 30 years. About a year ago, she and longtime Israeli peace negotiator Yossi Balin released a plan called the Holy Land Confederation, which seeks to lay the groundwork for a two-state solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Heba, welcome to Babel. Thank you very much for having me. How has your life changed since October 7th? My life has changed dramatically since October 7th in terms of witnessing the October 7th assault by Hamas on Israel first, and then the retaliation that took a tremendous force against the Gaza population. It wasn't just targeting Hamas, it was targeting the Gaza population and the loss of life and the destruction and the drastic conditions, living conditions, the humanitarian crisis affect every Palestinian. So, and we all live in stress and we all are trying to find ways and means to help the parties reach a ceasefire. From 2020 to 2022, you and Yossi Balin worked with a team to create a plan for the Holy Land Confederation. What were the main elements of your plan? First of all, we should understand also the background. Dr. Balin and myself believed that conflict management was not working. And we were going through periods of violence, escalation and de-escalation of violence. And the anticipation at that time was that there would be a third intifada of sorts. Of course, lo and behold, we have October 7th. But at the time, we realized that we have to reach a settlement of this conflict. This conflict cannot persist the way it had been persisting because neither side was living and enjoying security and stability. And the eruption and escalation of violence was happening intermittently, and there was always a threat that things will get out of hand. So Dr. Balin and myself thought that we need to provide a concept that would be a facilitator to the two-state solution and an enabler to the two-state solution. So we came up with this plan, realizing that, first of all, the two people, the Palestinians and the Israelis, are very much attached to the land, the whole land. That's number one. Number two, neither side had ever tackled the narrative in a written manner. So our proposal provides, in terms of the significant aspects of it, a chapter on the narrative, on the Palestinian Arab narrative, and on the Israeli Jewish narrative. And actually, it's a first chapter. So that was, in our opinion, an opening to a unique document that would have started the conversation on the two-state solution. Number two, because, again, both people have this deep attachment to the land, we believe that the Confederation would provide the opportunity for people to enjoy the land and not leave the land. And we propose that the Israeli settlers who are in the West Bank settlements who do not wish to leave or do not want to leave their homes to stay as permanent residents of the state of Palestine. And we will be swapping land, first of all. So the land will be swapped. And those lands that 
will not be swapped and will remain part of the state of Palestine where settlers are, they have the option to stay as permanent residents of the state of Palestine. Of course, this is all in the future now, but maybe we have an opportunity to see these things coming to fruition in light of the fact that now there is a tremendous call on a two-state solution and making this a reality in the near future, we hope. So th that's one aspect, which is these settlers will become permanent residents, and we offer by reciprocity an equal number of Palestinians to opt to take permanent residency in the state of Israel. And this category of exchange of permanent residencies would not affect the numbers of the Palestinian refugees who would be returning to the state of Palestine. So we also deal with the refugees who will return to the state of Palestine and then the exchange of the permanent residence between the two states. How was your proposal received a year ago when you made it? A year ago, it was very well received. It was a fresh idea, a creative idea, indeed a facilitator to the two-state solution. And when we launched it, which was first in the U.S., actually, we it was launched at the White House, members of Congress, and then we went to New York, to the U.N., and met with Secretary General Guterres. The idea was very welcome. From there, we went to Europe and had meetings with various members of the EU states and then EU presidency itself. Again, I think there was eagerness to have new ideas placed on the table to revive the discussion on the two-state solution and to provide avenues whereby the two sides can re-engage in constructive negotiations and discussions. And what's happened to that kind of work since October 7th? Since October 7th, actually, we continue. We continue to have discussions. But of course, the focus today is on the post-war days in Gaza and how the situation will be dealt with in terms of the humanitarian crisis and then the security apparatus that would be established in Gaza and who the parties will be involved in the entire reconstruction of Gaza. Nevertheless, we've had several discussions, not at official level yet, although with policymakers and diplomatic community, on how we can tailor the confederation idea into meeting the needs that have arisen since October 7th. And we are working on that right now. We're working actually on the security arrangements for Gaza within and without Gaza, in terms of the internal security and then the borders with the state of Israel. And we are exploring ideas, and we're exploring ideas for Jerusalem as well, developing the Jerusalem chapter. I mean, we've seen a shift in Israeli attitudes, and we've seen a shift in Palestinian attitudes since October 7th. Have you seen any shift in attitudes in people involved in this work? Has anybody dropped out? Or has anybody come on board? On the contrary, nobody has dropped out. We receive a lot of interest, as I said, to explain the parameters of it. Because I think as people are thinking beyond the day after Gaza, they're also thinking about the shape of the two-state solution and what options might be on the table to discuss the viable a solution and the viable end of conflict. So we've received quite a bit of interest from the diplomatic community, policymakers, think tanks. And we're talking about, you know, ministries of foreign affairs in various European countries where governments are listening, asking questions, and we are currently engaged to develop our work further. I was struck, there was a Financial Times article last week that talked about how Israelis who were willing to recognized Palestinian suffering in Gaza were being shunned by Israelis. Is the same thing true on the Palestinian side? Is there a sense that there's a war and people who are working with Israelis are giving aid and comfort to the enemy? Not to the same extent. I mean, you know, the Palestinian society has various layers to it. And we have the extreme right, those who are not willing to normalize 
and have not been willing to normalize for some time. And of course, they are not interested in a discussion. But you see more and more polls are actually showing that the Palestinians are moving more and more towards discussion on the two-state solution rather than the one-state solution, which was for a while advocated among Palestinians. Well, let's have a one-state solution based on equal rights and so forth and so on. Now you see a more realistic approach to the two-state solution. People are talking about separation. They want to separate. Although I was just looking at Khalil Shikaki's most recent poll, said that the number of West Bank Arabs supporting armed struggle was just over 50% before October 7th. Similar number now, 70% of Palestinians polled believe the decision to launch the October 7th attacks was correct. 93% of Palestinians polled said Hamas didn't commit atrocities that were shown in videos. As you know, Israeli numbers have turned steeply against a two-state solution as 63% of Israeli Jews oppose an independent, demilitarized Palestinian state. How do you bridge that gap? It feels like the gap is quite large, quite durable, and if anything, has grown larger in the last six months. Indeed, there is a gap. And indeed, many Palestinians, especially among the youth, which is alarming, believe that armed struggle and armed resistance is the only way to get from under the horrible conditions of the occupation under which they live, because they're basing their reactions in these types of polls on what is happening also in the West Bank because of the continuous Israeli incursions on a daily basis and the restrictions on movement post-October 7th. And I mean, just yesterday, there was a statistic coming out around 8,000 Palestinians have been detained since October 7th from the various Palestinian refugee camps in the West Bank. So the youth are the main target for all of this. And that's why I think they believe that armed struggle is a language that Israel understands. But at the same time, if we look beyond that, what kind of solution do we want? They want a two-state solution. They want to separate because they don't want to remain under occupation. So if you can help me understand what the Palestinian peace camp looks like. The Israeli peace camp is certainly aging. It is from a segment of Israeli society, overwhelmingly Ashkenazi. There are class elements to it. And it feels like this is a shrinking part of Israeli society and the war and the attacks that proceed that, that provoke the war are shrinking it still further. Help me understand, is the Palestinian peace camp composed of people in their 50s and 60s who had a period of greater integration with Israel, saw greater possibilities in the 1970s and 80s, and think that that can be resurrected? Or does it have other elements to it? I think, no, there are similarities between the Israeli peace camp and the Palestinian peace camp. So your observation is indeed correct in terms of the fact that both Peace camps are shrinking as the societies have become more and more polarized, and they react to each other. I think what we see on the ground is action and reaction. The more the Israeli right becomes stronger and stronger, the more the Palestinian right becomes stronger and stronger. And that, unfortunately, affects the youth more and more because their experience on the ground has been on the Palestinian side, one of incursions and restrictions on movement and lack of economic opportunity. And on the Israeli side, they see Hamas engaging in rocket attacks every other year or so, and the situation is very dangerous. So both youth live in fear, insecurity, and distrust of each other. And they have not seen a different model. They have not seen the prospects that end of conflict and peace would bring about. So they moved farther and farther away from each other, and there is no integration, no interaction. About 15 years ago, I remember one of the American peace negotiators was telling me I really had to meet the young Fatah leadership, that there was a sense of, of real hope on the Palestinian side. There were these ambitious young leaders who were going to move things in a more positive direction. I said I hadn't met such people. I hadn't heard of such people. I wasn't sure that they were 
the coming wave, the way he described them to be. And I'm still not sure who he was talking about. Is there a young political leadership that's a political leadership? Or is it, as you also suggest, there's a military leadership that is whipping people up behind the idea of armed resistance? Well, I think there is, I would say, a strong political leadership among Palestinians and less so of a military leadership. I think Fatah has clearly shaped its young members towards no militarization and towards civil disobedience at best, as opposed to a military opposition and a militant activities as a form of resistance. So there's a division, of course, between Fatah and Hamas on this matter. However, I think youth believe that Israel understands the language of armed resistance, but they're not necessarily engaging in armed resistance themselves. So that's something to distinguish and to understand and appreciate also in that youth can be directed and geared towards more political relationships with Israel than a militia-based relationship with Israel. When President Abbas called for elections in 2021, 36 parties listed themselves to run for election. So it was the big parties, Fatah and Hamas, and then 34 smaller lists were eager to run for election. And many of them involved a lot of young Palestinians who wanted elections, who wanted to renew and refresh and get new governance among themselves and to move away from the stalemate in which we have been living. So can I have you reflect on the idea of Palestinian political leadership? Yasser Arafat in many ways personified the Palestinian national ambitions for decades, but was a flawed individual. There's a lot of hope that Mahmoud Abbas would come in and be able to lead toward a better situation for Palestinians. And I think the conclusion of most Palestinians is things are much worse under Mahmoud Abbas. What constitutes leadership? What would a leader look like and be able to do given the disaffection, the disappointment, and often the the hostility that many Palestinians and especially young Palestinians feel? Well, I think, yes, indeed, Palestinian youth and even the middle-aged are very disappointed in the leadership that we have, be it in Ramallah or in Gaza. I mean, it's not just the youth who are disenchanted with Fatah and Hamas. They want to live in prosperous economic conditions, in government that delivers services, a government that provides a chance for everyone to engage in political life and express themselves freely and openly. In other words, they want a democratic government and one that provides national unity and one that is able to provide Gaza and West Bank with a united front. Most people do not want to see the division. And they did not want to see the fact that the two large parties were disagreeing so much so on the basic fundamentals of governance. I mean, the people in Gaza were also living in very difficult conditions with the Hamas control. All of this has lent the opportunity to the Israeli government to move away from the two-state solution and provided an opportunity for Israel to say there is no Palestinian partner. And so the blame and the disappointment stems from this fact as well, that our disunity, lack of proper governance, the authoritarianism with which both the Ramallah government and the Gaza government were handling the two jurisdictions, all provided ripe opportunity for Israel to disengage turn a blind eye and say, okay, we don't want to negotiate with the Palestinians. We're happy where we are. So, and again, happy with the continued state of conflict management that the Netanyahu government had espoused for the last 13, 14 years. And the Palestinians see themselves caught up in all of this that are not providing hope and opportunity, but rather creating a situation of despair and lack of opportunity. So how do we get there? How do we move to a different Palestinian political reality, especially since we're going to be dealing with the post-October 7th reality 
for many mm-hmm. years to come well, in terms of political leadership, in terms of reconstruction, in terms of the trauma that Israelis and Palestinians alike have been suffering Indeed. for the last six months. I think we need very strong leadership, Palestinian leadership, and I'm afraid we cannot do it alone. We need international support and we need international help because I think the Palestinian leadership and the Israeli leadership are not in a position to engage right now. And if we want to have a realistic opportunity to move forward and provide some stability and the security that both yearn for, we need the support of the international community and especially the US. We need to start with a permanent ceasefire so we can get the humanitarian conditions in Gaza and deal with the humanitarian crisis there. So we need the role of third parties in terms of decommissioning of the weapons, handling the governance, handling the health conditions, the food conditions, the basic life conditions, and for third parties also to feel safe providing this service. And so the threat of continued war cannot allow us to move to day two and day three. What can third parties do to encourage the formation, the emergence of a more effective Palestinian political leadership? Well, we know that President Abbas recently appointed a new government under the premiership of Dr. Muhammad Mustafa. And he has a team of ministers, pretty much all new to the establishment of government and leadership. We need to empower them, to facilitate for them their work so that they can be more and more legitimate, so that they can go with support of, let's say, international organizations, the third party governments, uh, the Arab countries, you know, everybody who has expressed goodwill to come into Gaza and assist the Palestinian Authority to manage and govern Gaza and establish rule of law in Gaza and slowly rehabilitate and undertake the reconstruction again with international organizations. But I have to be honest and open here and frank and say Israel cannot spoil this. We all have a responsibility so that we don't spoil this again and again and undermine the effort Because if we don't get the Israeli government to accept that they cannot stay in Gaza and allow the Palestinian Authority to come into Gaza, then what do we have? But your sense is this is with and through Fatah, rather than moving Fatah aside and working with this large number of non-Fatah groups that you talked about. We need transitions. We need the transition periods for sure. And we need to have elections. Right now, we can't hold elections. So until we hold elections, we cannot expect new leadership to emerge. So we have to deal with what we have today on the ground. And as a final question, what does getting back to peace talks look like? What's the pathway. You've been involved in a lot of negotiations Mm -hmm. over a long period of Mm -hmm. time. What's the first step to move people along? And what's the first step to reassure Israelis and Palestinians that things will be better rather than worse as a consequence of negotiating? We have to, to convince the Israeli public and the Palestinian public that peace is the answer. So we have to have a genuine, serious effort by the international community, especially by the U.S., because the Israeli right is very powerful today, and the Palestinian side is very weak today and disunited. So for any legitimate leadership on either side to emerge in order to engage in the negotiations, we cannot have extremism because extremism will not negotiate. Both extreme positions are so polarized that they will not even sit down and acknowledge each other, let alone negotiate a peace agreement. So I think we we really need to change the situation on the ground, demonstrate to the public that extremism does not provide peace and security. Once we stabilize Gaza, once 
the PA has the support of the international community. Law and order is established. Slowly, I think, the public opinion in Israel and in Palestine will start shifting and there will be more and more acceptance. But it's going to take some hard work and very serious challenges, and it's not going to be an easy task. And we seem to be shouldering on the international community a great deal, but I'm afraid the international community have abandoned us for such a long time. It's time for them to come back and shepherd this process again, because without them, we are not going to be able to do it alone. Hamba Husseini, thank you very much for joining us on Babel. Thank you very much for having me. John, during your discussion with Hiba, you mentioned how Palestinian youth are becoming increasingly supportive of armed struggle. Why are young people more hardline than their parents? Everybody responds to his or her own lived experience. And you really have a generation coming of age in both Israel and the West Bank and Gaza where there hasn't been interaction, where people only know each other remotely, where I think you have Israelis whose experience was first the suicide bombings of the second intifada, and then the sense that building the separation barrier gave Israelis greater security. You have Palestinians where their only experience seeing Israelis is either seeing armed settlers strutting around with weapons or going through checkpoints. And the idea of populations that live together, work together, there are Palestinians working in Israel for much of the 80s. As that experience goes away, I think you have a generation that sees this only through conflict, through issues of armed struggle, occupation, mediated by military service. And I think that the number of people who can even imagine anything else is aging. I mean, there is a generation that experienced that and a generation that built some degree of confidence and trust and engagement in years past. But with the dissolution of the Oslo Accords and the rise of tensions in the intervening years, young people have never had that experience. Their experience is mediated by military engagements and military conflict back and forth. And your point about the lack of opportunities for you know, interpersonal exchange has got even starker since the attacks of October the 7th. There used to be, I think, 100, 150,000 Palestinians from the West Bank who would go and work in Israel, largely in manufacturing and in agriculture each day. Those permits have been rescinded since October the 7th, so now there are even fewer opportunities. And this is something where a lot of younger Palestinians, I think, did want to have these economic opportunities and were prepared to have a different relationship with Israel. More than a decade ago now, I did some research into how West Bank Palestinians think about Hebrew as a language. And of the younger people I interviewed, nearly all of them said they actually wanted to learn Hebrew and their motive was for the economic opportunities. But there really now aren't very many. And, you know, previous guests we've had on Babel have talked about how difficult it is to meet normal Israelis. Khalil Sayer said he made a point of going to a checkpoint close to a settlement and deliberately trying to sit down with Israelis. But that's a really unique experience. And he said that when he was in Gaza, the only time he encountered Israelis was watching fighter jets flying overhead. The other point here is just the total failure of Palestinian politics. So many young people view the Palestinian Authority as illegitimate. And they view their difficult circumstances now as the result of failed negotiations in the past, where on the whole, it was Palestinian leaders who were perceived to have made most concessions. And so when they think about negotiations, they think this is the result that they're living in, the humiliations that Heber was talking about. And so they want something different. So what needs to happen for a new Palestinian political leadership to emerge, especially considering the regional and global interest in what that leadership looks like? 
So I understand that a lot of international actors want to see a new Palestinian leadership now, and there is really a lot of time pressure on the formation of this new leadership. But ultimately, I think it's going to take time for a leadership to emerge that can build genuine popular support among Palestinians. And if this process feels rushed, I think a lot of Palestinians will think these are people who have been imposed on us. They're puppets of the regional governments, puppets of Western governments, puppets of Israel. So the process needs to have a transition where a more technocratic government can try to address some of the governance issues, the corruption that's so endemic within the Palestinian Authority at the moment, and create more space for different voices to emerge that can build genuine popular support. Of course, international actors want to see things come quicker. But I do think there are a lot of actors, both regionally and internationally, who would like to veto certain candidates and would like to put parameters over the kinds of leaders who can emerge. And my fear is that by predetermining the outcome, it's going to be very difficult for those leaders to establish the legitimacy. And ultimately, there is still hope that the inclusion moderation theory works, that when leaders actually start integrating into political processes and realize some of the practicalities of governing and whatnot, that they will moderate later. So, you know, I think part of this is about not rushing the process and trying not to predetermine the outcome. But it also seems to me that Western governments are very interested in promoting some sort of democratic process with the idea that legitimacy comes from democracy and from votes. I think from both an Israeli and Arab standpoint, the view of those governments is we're less interested in legitimacy through democracy. We're more interested in legitimacy through outcomes. And one of the things that we're very interested in doing is finding ways to keep Hamas from taking power. But I think there are differences on the Arab side about whether any element of Hamas should be included. There are certainly some Arab voices who would like Hamas included as part of a broader national movement. I think some Arab voices that would like to exclude Hamas completely because they have general hostility to Muslim Brotherhood affiliated movements, what none of them are really interested in, certainly the Israelis aren't interested in at all, is the idea of elections with uncertain outcomes, with the possibility that that would plant the seeds of Hamas to take over both the West Bank and Gaza. I'm not sure how we reconcile the Western interest in democratization as the only durable legitimacy and the Arab and Israeli hostility to democratization as a reckless rolling of the dice that could lead Hamas to coming back to power. And unless you can begin to get some sort of understanding on that, I think we end up tripping over ourselves rather than really laying the groundwork. I do think that in the near term, legitimacy will come from outcomes. But where we go from that initial point is something that I think is going to need to take a lot of work, and I'm not sure exactly how that's going to play out. Could the process of reconstruction in Gaza contribute to peacemaking? There's no question in my mind that it can, partly because reconstruction is about pouring resources in, and resources give you walking around money, resources give you legitimacy, resources allow you to build patronage networks and everything else. I expect that the people donating the resources will have some strings to make sure it's not all ending up in Swiss bank accounts. So it gives you the beginning, and that gives you the beginning of an opportunity to forge a different relationship with Israel. I think that some of the Arab states are going to insist that there be some Israeli concessions to Palestinian national aspirations alongside efforts to contribute to the economic reconstruction of Gaza. There may even be some Israeli contributions to the reconstruction of Gaza to replace things that Israel has destroyed in the course of the war. But how that all gets sequenced and coordinated, I'm less certain of. Certainly, it does seem to me that the work of reconstruction will drive Arab governments to talk more with the Israelis. But how that actually manifests itself on Palestinian domestic governance 
is, I think, more of an opportunity than a certainty right now. And the process of reconstruction is going to have real implications for the political future of Gaza as well. I mean, discussions about independence versus interdependence. So when you're thinking about infrastructure, do you want Gaza to be dependent on Israel? Or do you want to do it in a way where it can actually be independent? And all of these political choices are going to be really difficult to work through. But I do think there is some hope that in the process of having those discussions, you can build trust between Israel and Arab governments in the region, as John said, between Israel and certain Palestinian leaders who come to have a role in shaping this. And that process of discussing these really tricky things could actually end up getting to a better place. Of course, it could also do the opposite. There could be a real trust deficit, which ruins the ability to conduct reconstruction at all. So it has the potential to contribute to peace building, but that is certainly not a given. And one of the real challenges here is you have what I would describe, what I have described as a weak political leadership on the Israeli side, the Palestinian side, and the U.S. side. I think the U.S. leadership will be firmer after the November elections. I don't know what happens with Israeli politics. Israeli politics seem especially fraught. Palestinian politics are especially fraught. How you move societies to do these very difficult, complicated things without either strong leadership or confidence in a partner that's going to be there in a year, two years, three years, makes the long-term planning especially difficult. Here's a place where the Arab states have leaders who all expect to be there for decades to come. They're not in a rush. But how we figure out, do we wait until the American election and things become clear from the U.S. side, from people have a sense for what the U.S. is going to really push for and invest in? Do we wait until Israeli politics become clear? As Will said, Palestinian politics will take some time to clarify. And it seems to me that one of the really important problems that people haven't put enough attention to is that coordinating everybody's pace and coordinating the clarification of different national politics makes getting out of the hole that we're in now that much more difficult. Because unless you can have some sort of political leadership, unless you have people who can inspire with a vision of where this can go and can implement and rally people behind them. And you need it on the Israeli side and the Palestinian side. And the American side can help galvanize and encourage and help galvanize the world, as indeed American diplomacy has been central to all the efforts to get out of this war. But how we get there, to me, is an overwhelmingly difficult problem. And I'm not sure given the American election cycle, I'm not sure how quickly we can get there and I'm not sure how far we can go until we can get there. Thanks for joining me, John and Will. Thank, Thank you. you, Leah. Thanks for listening to Babel. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find more analysis on this topic linked in the show notes on the CSS website and you can find us on Twitter at CSIS Mideast. Thank you.